Hello, I am Professor S. Shankaran in the Department of Metallurgical and Materials Engineering. We will now go a little closer. We will we'll concentrate more on technical aspects now. Uh, types of material failure and uh, basic type, types of deformation and fracture. So, in one line, if you want to see, this mechanical behavior of material is all about studying the deformation and fracture of engineering materials, right. So, so we can now divide that into two. First is uh, deformation. Uh, what type of deformation? One is time independent, another is time dependent, right. So, time independent, it can be elastic or it can be plastic, right. And, uh, time dependent is creep, okay. So, materials undergo elastic deformation, you know most of the material undergo elastic deformation, okay. And, uh, and materials also undergo plastic deformation, okay. This is which what, this is what we want to avoid, right, in an engineering component or structure vehicle, we want to avoid plastic deformation. But we should uh, know what under what circumstances this uh, you know failure occurs. That is the essential of this subject. Okay. So these two deformations, whether it is elastic or plastic, is a time independent. Okay. It is not depending upon time. Okay. So on the other hand, the deformation can be time dependent. Okay. So the one of the primary uh, engineering property or failure is creep, right? It is a time dependent deformation, right? We will uh, slowly uh, look at it. So, on the other hand, if you take the fracture, uh, you can look at it at, uh, in two broad categories. Whether fracture occurs uh, under static loading or fracture occurs under cyclic loading. So, there are two possibilities. So, under stat static loading, the fake fracture or failure can be uh, brittle in nature, brittle in nature or ductile in nature or it could be environmental or creep fracture. So, some of these terms are becoming more technical now. So, we should know what is brittle fracture and what is ductile fracture. Uh, brittle fracture is something what we have just seen in the spectacular uh, failures photos like you know the ship becoming two pieces in a uh, without any warning you know, two pieces brittle fracture. Uh, ductile fracture the pipe you have seen right, the large deformation the, you know. Um, and then environmental is you know corrosion, you know, it, it could be oxidation, corrosion, you know, hot corrosion and so on. Creep rupture is like you know it, time dependent as, as you keep on you know if the component or in structures are subjected to a deformation at a high temperature over a period of time, then uh, this is uh, this type of failure coming to each other. And coming to Cyclic loading, it is called fatigue. Fatigue is uh, cyclic loading. It can be high cycle, low cycle, fatigue crack growth, corrosion fatigue. Um, yeah, we will we will get into this details uh, of each one of aspect. But high cycle generally, uh, you know, it is a stress control fatigue normally. Um, for example, um, you know, uh, the components which undergo uh, stresses within you know elastic region for, for a very long time right uh, that is stress controlled right. So, uh, low cycle means uh, the very word uh, uh, you know says that you know the material will sustain only very low number of cycles that means you know uh, that means the stresses are very high we will be uh, the component is uh, undergoing cyclic loading in a 
much more plastic deformation or a strain control, strain, lot of plastic strain is cycled. We will see it uh, all those in details. So, the high cycle means that means the components will, uh, will sustain quite a bit of uh, or quite a number of cycles, very high cycles, right. So, that because the material itself is within the elastic uh, uh, regime, right, before uh, yield point, okay. So, we will see that. Uh, when it comes to that point. Fatigue crack growth, so uh, we, we, we just, uh, I, I just mentioned a couple of times before about these you know, flaws and critical flaws and so on, right. So, a flaw will grow if, when it, if it is there in the component or any structures or vehicles which is under use, uh, the flaw will grow, okay. But how much, uh, you know, what is the speed of the growth, okay, and at, at what condition it becomes uh, uh, critical or it attains a critical size, these are all the uh, important idea, right, very, very important, right. Uh, the fracture mechanics, you know, subject greatly deals with this and helps engineers to predict some of the life of these structures, right, very important, right. Uh, similarly, the corrosion fatigue. So, uh, corrosion is also, uh, it can be static as well as cyclic. So, that is why it came as under environmental heading in the static loading. But in um, cyclic loading as well, uh, corrosion fatigue takes place. So, this is also having primary, primary, I mean, this is also finding primary. Uh, concern in most of the um, power plants kind of environment where you have uh, materials undergo uh, stresses or loading under severe environments, right. So, that is also very important, okay. Okay, before um, um, we get into uh, the real syllabus or subjects, as I mentioned, we will spend a lot of time on fundamentals. So, we will start with scratch chemical bonding, right, all of you are familiar with. So, that it is always good to start with something which you are familiar, right, and then we connect how, how, the, why do you want to review this? What is the connection of uh, chemical bonding with mechanical behavior? That is exactly I want all of you to understand. There is a strong connection, okay. So, let us now review what is the chemical bonding. So, you all of us know that there are uh, primary chemical bonds and secondary chemical bonds. The what we are seeing here is uh, ionic sodium and chloride ions um, which exhibits uh, ionic bonding. The second one is uh, a water molecule which exhibits a covalent bonding and it is a metallic, uh, it is a magnesium, magnesium metal exhibiting uh, a metallic bond, okay. So, we will slowly describe this uh, uh, bonding. Um, what is this ionic bond? Ionic bond is, uh, you know, um, electrons are transferred in ionic bonding as in NaCl. That means the, you have this, uh, you know, sodium ion and chlorine ion. So, electrons are transferred from sodium to chlorine, okay. So, it is completely transferred, then they stay as ions. That is why it is called ionic bonding. Yeah. So, when it comes to water, the, the bond between the hydrogen and uh, the chlorine is uh, the electrons are shared, okay. The electrons are shared in the covalent bonding as in water, but uh, the water has got some more uh, typical interesting properties. What you see here is, uh, see this bond is covalent bond. But water is also very 
uh, all of you would have studied this is also will exhibit a dipole moment right so you have this uh, hydrogen atom and uh, the this portion of oxygen uh, sorry yeah this portion of oxygen will have negatively charged because of this electron uh, excess electron here and this side it is uh, positive and this side is negative so it will be a a dipole moment or permanent dipole moment okay so water is also called a polar solvent right so all of you know so not here we are showing the hydrogen uh, I, I mean here we are taking a water as an example but any molecule which exhibit this kind of a dipole also will form a bond okay that is secondary bond anyway we will talk uh, we will we'll discuss that in the next one so the covalent bond is uh, shared electrons are shared between them and um, what is metallic bond metallic bond is uh, given up to common cloud so it's a very general description so what it what it means is uh, your ions are there positive ions are the metal ions are there they are embedded in the sea of electrons right so that's called described here as a cloud okay so this and all um, you all know it but our idea here is uh, each one of this bond we will connect to uh, the its strength and uh, uh, mechanical behavior right that is the idea. So, uh, here is uh, the three dimensional crystal structure of sodium chloride consisting of two interpenetrating FCC structures on each solid. So, what you are seeing here is um, another very popular crystal structure or material I would say diamond. Uh, which has got a diamond cubic crystal structure of carbon. It is a allotrope of carbon. All of you know this. As a result of a strong and a directional covalent bond. So, this is one uh, interesting aspect of covalent bond which is relevant to any mechanical behavior. Okay. Covalent bonds are directional in nature okay. um, and uh, and they are uh, very strong and that is why diamond has got the highest melting point or melting temperature and it is also having highest hardness and elastic modulus of all known solids. Okay. So, uh, it, it gives some idea right if you have a covalent bond in all directions not necessarily in only one the one for example, even in water you had uh, you know covalent bond right between hydrogen and uh, oxygen, but that is not uniform everywhere it is just one bond ok. So, that type of bond is also called hydrogen bonding we will come to that ok we will talk about do not confuse uh, with that. So, water has got a very you know you can talk about dipole bonds, you can talk about hydrogen bond, you can talk about covalent bond. So, water is very interesting solvent right are interesting liquid. Uh, but what we here we are talking about if you have a covalent bond um, uniform covalent bond with its neighbor suppose for example, if you take the single unit here uh, the each carbon has got you know the tetragonal unit. So, they are all you know covalent bond. So, that is why they are very strong and uh, a material which exhibit this kind of a directional covalent bond uniform with its neighbor which generally exhibit high melting point, high hardness and high elastic modulus very important right elastic modulus. Okay. Then coming to this uh, uh, Polymeric materials, uh, which is uh, what we are showing here, is ethylene. And uh, polymers are all molecular structures, right? They are all molecular structures. Okay, this is a molecular structure of ethylene, 
gas C2H5 polyethylene polymer. The double bond is repeated by two single bonds in polyethylene permitting formation of a chain molecules. You see, uh, so far uh, we have just looked at atoms, uh, whether you, you know, talk about metallic bond, whether you talk about uh, ionic bond, covalent bond, we were just talking, talking the bond between atoms. But now here, we, we are switching over to molecular structures, right. So, there is a difference. So, uh, so molecular structures have chains, so mostly have chain molecules, right. Polymers are all made up of chain molecules. Uh, so, within this chain, you have this uh, carbon, hydrogen, this uh, covalent bond. And uh, how these chain molecules are uh, getting together, are held together, that is again an, an interesting uh, point of view. You have to think about it. So, that is where uh, we, uh, we are going to discuss about this uh, secondary bonds. So, the first one uh, what you are seeing here is again um, oxygen to hydrogen secondary bonds between water molecules. So, each one is water. So, you see that uh, uh, hydrogen, this is an oxygen. So, there is a bond. Uh, these are all called hydrogen bonding. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, you can also have, you know, uh, the water also exhibits dipole and here we are now not talking about that. There are uh, any molecule which exhibits a dipole will, will also uh, show a permanent dipole bonds. And in water, uh, we are now talking about hydrogen bond, okay, the hydrogen bond here, right. So, uh, secondary bonds. Uh, primarily you know known as van der Waals forces because of the electrostatic interactions and uh, they are weak forces or weak bonds that is why it is called secondary bonds and you also have hydrogen bonds and dipole bonds ok. So, most uh, we are now here preferring to hydrogen bonding. Similarly, if you look at this uh, hydrogen to chlorine uh, secondary bonds between the chain molecules in polyvinyl chloride. So, so this is one unit this whole unit uh, and this is another unit, they are all just held by this uh, secondary bond, ok. So, this is hydrogen and chlorine, this is uh, they are all held between these two. Uh, so, uh, so this particular uh, schematic shows that you know all the polymeric material uh, are uh, having primarily um, chain molecules and they are held together by van der Waals forces or secondary bonds. So, that is how we should uh, keep in mind. But the bond bonding between uh, each of this carbon atom and hydrogen, they are all covalent bonds, ok. So, uh, we will come, we, when we discuss the, you know, uh, the external force on each one of them, then we will understand why this uh, bonding is important, right. So, for example, the question here is suppose if I am just taking a polymeric material uh, and then I am trying to apply uh, external load, which bond will respond first, right? Which or which bond will resist to keep the material intact or which are the forces will act against the external forces? That is that is the question, right? So, these are the uh, aspects we will look at it uh, as we move along. So, here is a model, um, consider um, two atoms, they are all held by some imaginary springs. Uh, the distance between these two atoms is R naught, uh, that means uh, that two atoms are held together in an equilibrium position or stable position. And then the next image shows that these two atoms are pulled apart in a tension. So, the R naught become R 1 and uh, the 
image C shows the two atoms are getting compressed, the distance becomes R2. Please remember all this uh, deformation are within elastic limits, right? We are talking about elastic deformation. So, you are able to pull it in tension, you are able to compress the two atoms together. So, what happens when you when you have these kind of two atoms which are held in the equilibrium position, you try to pull it and try to compress it, what happens? So, um, you can clearly um, see that uh, there is something happens to the interatomic forces or interatomic energy which is plotted against the as a function of R, okay. So, if you look at the top image and let us describe this, this is a plot between uh, interaction energy versus separation R. The, the top curve is repulsive energy, the bottom is electrostatic attract, attractive energy. So, the, the net force is in between, it is a potential bell or the potential bell, sorry, potential bell curve, that is, that is how it has been popularly known. So, uh, when it is repulsive, when it is attractive, so when the, as the separation goes up, then the attractive forces are increasing. When the atoms are coming closer and closer and then the repulsion uh, energy goes up. So, it can be and you can also calculate the force that is what shown in the bottom figure, the force versus separation. Uh, the interesting uh, point to notice, if you look at this, the force is 0 at R0, there is no force, net force is 0 at R0, that means when the at two atoms are in the equilibrium position, there is no force, okay. Then the, the as the separation between two atoms larger, becoming larger, then the slope changes and it reaches a maximum. So, derivative is 0, right. So, so the decrease in slope as separation increases. So, the slope becomes almost decreases and becomes 0. So, the energy can be represented by the formula u i is equal to minus a by r to the power m plus b by r to the power n, okay. So, the first one is uh, um, attraction and second one is repulsion, okay. The exponent of the repulsive term n, this, this term is usually much larger than the m. So, because as the two atoms are brought together, they are electronic orbitals superimpose and strong repulsion as you go in this direction, this curve, right. Due to Pauli's exclusion principle. So, this all uh, we know, but we are now trying to connect all of them. Uh, so, so, the interatomic force is obtained by F is equal to dou i by dou r and, uh, and as is shown in this figure, the force is 0 at the bottom of the interaction energy curve. So, here if you look at this curve, it is a bottom we are referring to that is, uh, uh, that is the force is 0 at the bottom and which also corresponds to R naught here, right. So, this we will, uh, we, we are just introducing this curve uh, here, but we will spend uh, more time on this curve, it is called the Condon-Morse curve, right. 
So, we will also connect this uh, property uh, to the elastic modulus and we will also connect this to you know atomistic uh, you know uh, I would say atomistic relation with its elastic property you know what is the atomic basis for the elastic properties of materials. So, so we will spend uh, more time on this curve. So, this is just an introduction ok. So, if you look at uh, um, chemical bonding uh, much more closely. So, same curve here um, this is uh, F r uh, is, is, is a subscript r supposed to be subscript a supposed to be subscript force attraction force repulsive force right. So, so this is a equilibrium distance r naught and this is a resultant force uh, and this bottom one is a potential energy the, the previous one uh, what we have just looked at before is uh, force versus separation interatomic energy versus separation there are so many ways to look at the uh, the physical event right so many so many ways so here force is the same force versus separation is there but it is potential energy w versus separation okay so we will try to look at uh, bond energy bond type and bond length okay uh, when do you say bond length what kind of each bond has got a characteristic bond length or uh, each molecule is characterized with bond length ok. So, when the distance of separation is r naught the attractive and repulsive forces exactly balance each other and the net force is 0 this is what we have seen. The distance corresponds to the stable equilibrium with a minimum in potential energy the magnitude of the minimum energy w naught is called bond energy. So, so we are bringing this uh, potential energy versus separation curve to bring the idea of bond energy right. So, what is that energy that is the energy the minimum energy where uh, the distance between the bottom of the potential well and the 0. So, that is w naught is a bond energy which is measured kilo the units is kilo joule per mole ok. So, according to the strength chemical bonds can be grouped into primary and secondary see this we have already seen primary bond and secondary bond and how about their energies. So, that is the question now we are going because we are going to talk about mechanical response right. So, we start from this basic. The primary bonds have uh, bond energies in the range of 100 to 1000 kilo joule per mole. So, this is a primary bond. So, what are the primary bonds they are ionic covalent metallic. So, they are in the range of 100 to uh, 1000 kilo joule per mole ok. And uh, among this primary bonds uh, the covalent and ionic bonds are generally stronger than the metallic bonds. So, very important. So, you have to keep that in mind covalent and ionic bonds are stronger than the metallic bond ok. Secondary bonds have the energies in the range of 1 to 50 kilo joules per mole ok uh, is much uh, lower than the primary bond energies. One or two orders of magnitude smaller than th those of primary bonds and the examples we have already seen van der Waals bond and hydrogen bonds they come into this. Uh, energy range ok. So, it is useful to classify materials according to the bond type that is dominant in a given material 
it helps in predicting the approximate properties and behavior of a material under a given set of conditions. So, uh, what, what does it mean bond type and that is dominant in a given material. So, you, you can have uh, a bond which is more than uh, one character that is what it means. One can have uh, you know ionic bond and metallic bond, you know, ionic and covalent. So, which will dominate? Suppose if I have a material which has the characteristic of ionic and covalent or ionic and metallic. So, which character is uh, dominant? So, that is what means here. Okay. So, if you know that uh, what is the type of dominant bond, then it will again easier to predict the behavior under this set of conditions. So, the relationship between uh, atomic size and the bond length. So, we looked at bond energy and uh, bond length and uh, uh, types bond type. So, now we look at uh, bond length and uh, an atomic size, how they are related. The length of a bond is defined as the center to center distance of the bonding atom. So, again we will refer to this potential well curve, potential energy versus R. So, when the, the distance between the two atoms is R naught, the center to center distance is uh, bond length. Okay. So, that is uh, when atom are at equilibrium position R naught, then the center to center distance is called bond length. So, strong bonds pull the bonding atoms closer together and so have smaller bond lengths as compared to weaker bonds. So, this is quite understandable, right. So, uh, we have now seen the bond energies, right. So, how strong they are. So, so they will try to hold together more tightly than the weaker bonds like Van der Waals or hydrogen or dipole bonds. So, uh, for primary bonds, they have the lengths in the range of 1 to 2 angstrom or 0.1 to 0.2 nanometers. Uh, secondary bond lengths, they are much larger in the range of 2 to 5 angstrom or 0.2 to 0.5 nanometers. So, very important to keep this. So, uh, this is a very interesting point. Uh, when the bonding is between two neighboring atoms of same kind, the atomic diameter is simply equal to the bond length. Okay. So, suppose if you do not have a similar atoms, right, it, you can have a solid solutions, right, or you can have ionic solid like sodium chloride and so on, so where you, you do not you don't have a same type of atoms, you have a different types of atoms together. Then, then what happens? Then you look at this uh, similar potential energy versus separation curve for uh, atoms of different kind. One is, you know, for for example, ionic solid. So this is a anion and this is a cation. So Rc plus Ra. This is a radius of cation and plus radius of anion. So this distance is the bond length. So, that is why there is some ambiguity in this definition arises if the element in question exhibits different crystal forms. So, another question it is not necessarily a, a anion cation issue if it is same material exhibits a, a different crystal form. For example, the diameter of iron atom is 2.48 angstrom when it is surrounded by 8 neighbors in the BCC crystal and 2.54 angstrom when it is when it has 12 types okay as in the ionic bonding. So, uh, the bond length is equal to the sum of their radii or C plus R A as shown here. So, so depending upon the crystal structure these uh, uh, suppose the same material is undergoing some transformation 
then also this question, uh, this ambiguity will come. And it, in the case of ionic solids, if the uh, ions are different, then also you have to look into uh, the definitions a bit more careful. That is all uh, we want to say here. So, uh, one last uh, aspect uh, I want to cover before I stop this uh, lecture today. The effect of uh, temperature on the mean spacing between atoms forming a chemical bond. Very important, right? So, what happens if the temperature is uh, rising, right? Again, we will uh, use this potential energy versus separation curve. So, what, what are the descriptors? The equilibrium distance of separation shown applies to 0 Kelvin, very important. So, whatever we have just uh, talked about this R0, the distance between two atoms so called equilibrium position is referred to 0 Kelvin, very important, right. So, there is no thermal energy, right. So, at higher temperatures under the influence of thermal energy, atoms vibrate, very important, atoms vibrate about their mean positions. The amplitude of vibrations increasing with increasing temperature. So, this is what it is shown here. What you see here is R naught is at uh, 0 Kelvin and you take a temperature at T 1, then the R naught uh, is here, R naught prime. The atom will try to vibrate between two positions A1 and B1 at T1 temperature, okay. And uh, at T2, the R naught uh, will become R naught double prime here, and then atom will vibrate between these two positions A2 and B2. So, the yeah, this is what is uh, shown here. Um, the amplitude is A1, B1 at uh, under T2, amplitude is A2, B2, okay. What another important uh, interesting observation is, as the temperature goes up, you can see that you uh, know the R0 which is here, which is which is also increasing, right. So, the corresponding mean spacing between the atoms are all given by R naught prime and R naught double prime. As the repulsive force is in short range in nature as compared to the attractive force, the potential energy curve is steeper on the left hand side. Very important uh, point, you have to read this line again. So, um, so this is a net curve, right? That is what we have seen in the previous, from the previous description. So, the, the repulsive force is in short range um, as compared to the attractive force potential energy curve. So, the curve is steeper on the left hand side, the curve is steeper on the left hand side than the, the right hand side. That is why you see that uh, the R naught as the temperature increases, the R naught, uh, you know, keep on increasing, very important observation. So, it is a kind of, you know, the curve is asymmetric, right, An asymmetric nature of the curve and uh, it, it gives a very important, uh, you know, uh, idea that is the, the mean bond length increases on heating. In other words, the material exhibits thermal expansion. So, the most fundamental uh, property of a material, thermal expansion. So, we are kind of, you know, arriving at uh, one phenomenon, which is, you know, um, have the atomic basis or chemical bond as a basis, atomic basis, right. Thermal expansion, the very fundamental property of uh, any material. Um, now, we are showing that. Uh, why it is expanding, you know, why thermal expansion happens or 
how this uh, uh, mean equilibrium distance is to keep on increasing with increasing in the temperature, right? Okay. So, I will stop here. Uh, um, we will continue in the next class. Okay. Thank you.